In the First World War, there were only 21 persons allowed to be members of the press corps at any time. I happened to have a syndicate of smaller newspapers that got me in. But we all jumped up and went over the top. And I felt no fear, I felt exhilaration instead. It was tremendous. And then our barrage stopped. And then the great surprise of my life, it was total silence. There was nothing there. And this is the first time that anybody who wasn't committed to Bolshevism got into Russia, you see. And all of us flocked in there. And of course, the first thing we wanted to see was, the interview, of course, was Lenny. We tried to interview him, what you might call, on the run, in this push. And someone started out by saying, you speak English. Well, what a question to ask a great man. And he said, I speak him. Is the English language not so very good? <laughs> that was his answer, which was all right. This is, uh, this is my friend Mussolini, who continued to call me Caro Collego on every occasion that I met him. On the February 29th, I'll never forget the date because he said, look, I forgot it was leap, leap year. I have, no, I have no appointments. I kept asking him, so I'll talk to you for hours. I have nothing to do today. And he talked to me for a couple hours. George Seldes, former foreign war correspondent and premier press muckraker who's been suppressed by the establishment media, makes his TV debut tonight on Alternative Views. <laughs> When the late editor of The Nation magazine, Carrie McWilliams, was asked to name the 10 greatest muckrakers in the history of American journalism, he named a few names that we're all probably familiar with. People like Lincoln Steffens, Upton Sinclair, I.F. Stone, Ralph Nader. But there was one name that most of you are probably not familiar with. George Seldes. Don't feel too embarrassed. George Seldes is a man who's lived in the shadows of American journalism, a giant living in the shadows of American journalism. Why haven't you heard of him? Well, for most of his journalistic career, he's been, you might call it, a marked man. Boycotted, blacklisted by the American press establishment. Why? Well, he went after the press itself. He was the press's critic. Tonight, at age 90, George Seldes will get his American television debut. At the uh, end of his life, Lincoln Steffens, perhaps the quintessential muckraker himself, ended up becoming very disenchanted with muckraking. He sure. thought that um, perhaps they were missing the real point. And he said that all of these stories about corruption essentially don't question the underlying system. Was there any philosophy that underlay your criticism, any social or political philosophy that underlay your criticism of establishment journalism? I believe in revisionist history. I believe that history is largely written wrong, which I'm not the original, uh, I didn't originate that phrase, you know. I mean, I mean, Napoleon said so. Napoleon said, history's lies agreed upon, you know, and, and things like that. Well, I mean, 
the muckrakers have, I think, to some extent, made a living on, on revising history. Now, that last book of mine, which is called Even the Gods Cannot Change History, is supposed to tell the facts which were wrong in the books. But you are a reporter that has spent his life trying to keep us all abreast of the difference between fact and fiction. But you have a story to tell us uh, in your first experience with the press and its role in myth-making in World War I. In the First World War, there were only 21 persons allowed to be members of the press corps at any time. G2 was intelligence, we were G2D, which meant we were the press department of the intelligence department. Very well. So I was one of the lucky people. All the rest were important people like Irvin S. Cobb, Damon Runyon, William Allen White, George Patillo, William Slavins McNutt, Colliers, Saturday Evening Post, all these notable names were there. I happened to have a syndicate of smaller newspapers that got me in. Well, <coughs> I was brought, I was, my experience was on a small newspaper and I knew about what the press was up to and all like that. I wasn't taken in by the grandeur of the great names and the great people. Maybe that's one of the reasons why I'm telling you this story, perhaps. Well, anyway, I, I, I think I mentioned the fact that, uh, that in July the 18th, the American troops, led by the Marines, by the way, give them full credit there, actually led by the second division of which the Marines were only half, but the Marines got credit for everything, always do, you know, uh, smashed the Hindenburg line. And when we saw Hindenburg later, he admitted this was the decisive day of the war. The American, it was the first time our lines had been broken and you can say that that was the American troops which won the war. I don't think he used the phrase won the war, but would change the tide of the war. That's the phrase he used, very well. Flush called in um, uh, Pershing and said, look, I have a brilliant idea. Why don't your fine American fresh troops, which have had this terrific victory, you see they're now marching towards Germany, end the war by a wonderful uh, pincher movement. This is the San Miel salient, and he called it a dagger pointed at the heart of France. He says, why don't we attack at the two edges of the salient, see? And and join our armies there, trap 100,000 Germans in San Miel, you see, liberate San Miel, the first time to be li town to be liberated after four years of war, and I already trapped the German army, and immediately turn our troops, and he had a great idea for getting all the way to the Rhine. Well, Pershing was very pleased with it, and we all went and got ready. It took us till September about the 11th to get ready for this work. And then at a signal, either 4.30 or 5, I, in the book I say 5, we were all to go over the top on these two sides, cross no man's land, converge our armies, and trap the Germans and capture San Miel. Well, there I was, you see, the youngest member of the army, by the way, of the press section. Uh, let me see, in 1928, I was 28. I was, uh, in 1918, I was 28. Well, there we were in the trenches. This is not my first time. I've been in the Rainbow Division. I think I told you one day that my first night in the trenches, and it was a normal night where nothing happens, like in Westen nichts Neues, or nothing happened, except that on the trench next to the one in which I was in, I was with the Ohio's, a shell happened to break through the cover, and there were eight men in the dugout, officers and men, they were all killed. And just that shell fell 20 feet from our dugout. That's, that's nothing happened that night, you see. But this was the greatest barrage we had ever put over, you see. And there I was, thinking I was a coward. I think I, my life, I've always thought, if I came to some physical decision, I might be a coward. I might run away. I might not face it. I've never had an experience like this. I mean, it's all right to steal pictures off the wall of somebody you're interviewing, you know, or the man who committed suicide in a newspaper or something like that. But this was a great test, you know. And so I was there. And I tell you that I think the main thing is mass psychology. I was there with all the doughboys. I mean, the whole Rainbow Division. I think we were all, in a way, I mean, they say the good soldier must feel fear. We were all trembling with fear, perhaps, but when the moment said, go over the top, and you realize that for four years, anybody that showed a hand over the top, or let alone his head, got it blown off. 
we all jumped up and went over the top. And I felt no fear, I felt exhilaration instead. It was tremendous. And then our barrage stopped. And then the great surprise of my life, it was total silence. There was nothing there. After all these years, there was no reply from the Germans. There was nothing. There was no man's land. We walked wherever we wanted. I found, we found the ruins of a plane that had been shot down earlier, an old tank, turret shot out or something. We got to the German trenches. We admired how well they lived. They even had electric lights in their trenches. They lived well, you know, at least the officers did. And we went across, and nothing happened. So I said, well, you know, we were on the pinchers. That was 20, you know, that was, if San Miguel was there, we were up 50 miles away or something, you see. So I said, this is no good. I'll never get there. And, of course, being one of the lucky people in the press section, I had a Cadillac. That was the only time in my life I ever did. I had a Cadillac and a sergeant who drove it and all that. That's what the 21 of us each ranked the Cadillac. And I went and got my driver. And uh, I said, look, uh, let's drive back and try to get into San Miguel. And then he was the brilliant man. He said, look, everybody's going to try to do it. Now, we know that all the roads are mine. And when they're not mine, there are tank traps. Now, look, here's what we will do. Let us drive around. We have the time. Let us drive around and make a detour and then come to on San Miguel from another section north of the town you see where they never expected anybody to come from and maybe they will, we will get in there and he drove around to a town called Chauvancourt which was northwest when we came to Chauvancourt we found a trap in the town the main road went through the town the tank trap was a hole between the houses so that nobody could get through but we were practically in San Miguel there so we left the car on the other side of the tank trap you see we walked across to the, we walked on the side street where no car could a little narrow street we got to the river Meuse or as General Pershing called it the Muz we got there and to our there was San Miguel in front of us and to our great surprise we found French colonials, work troops, building a plank bridge into the town where the big bridge had been destroyed. And they were in sort of blue fatigue or whatever it was, so they had been there before us, and nevertheless, being the uh, correspondents dressed in practically an officer's uniform, you know, we didn't have, those who did wore the whole Sam Brown belt, but those who felt queasy about it, left off the shoulder strap, just the belt around here, but an officer's uniform. We got there, and they all thought, hurrah. They said, who are you? Are you Germans? You're wearing a brown uniform. <laughs> we said, no, we're the Americans. Well, when they heard Americans, they gave us the grand ovation. And then we said, well, where are the Germans? They said, the Germans have been gone for almost two weeks. So here General Pershing and Foch and all our great intelligence had made this greatest attack with the greatest expenditure of ammunition we'd ever made with tanks in preparation. I think that Patton's tanks were in the back of us and all that. And there wasn't one German there. They had at least 10 days earlier pulled out and there was nobody in San Miguel but the few French colonials building a bridge which we crossed and the whole town turned out in the, t in, in the center, you see, and gave us the reception. Two hours later, General Pershing, who had got caught in one of those tank traps or, you know, or mines or something, eventually got there with the Secretary of uh, the War, Newton D. Baker, with General Patin, who was the commander of that front, uh, whom Forch sent. And uh, Clemenceau was supposed to meet him there, too, but he got lost, you know. And, and worst of all, the U.S. Signal Corps, which was supposed to take movies of the triumphal entry of San Miguel, never got there at all. So the photographs I took, these few stills on a little camera that I brought with me, I think it was about two inches by three inches, in plates, by the way, are the only, the, the, the only uh, historical evidence of Pershing walking across the plank two hours after I was there into the town. Well, you could never repeat 
this great celebration for Pershing, you see, which they gave us. However, they, the, the mayor and the chief of police and some of the people who had been in hiding and came from elsewhere, and there was a, a few speeches made at the city hall and honored. Well, I told them who Pershing was. They didn't even know his name. The Germans didn't tell them much about our, the American army being there. Well, the main point is this, that despite the fact that there was no capture, stunning capture, sh uh, storming of San Miel, I told you what there was there. We went to no man's land, nothing. Uh, and no triumphal entry, because certainly the edge had been taken off. Uh, the story was um, cabled to America. San Miguel captured American troops, greatest victory in the whole war, uh, General Pershing's triumphal entry in San Miguel. To this very day, it appears in books, because a professor, I can't think of his name just now, but I have letters from him, as late as a year or two ago, a man wrote a history of the First World War or something, and which he uses a story, and I wrote to him, and he said, well, if I ever, if it's ever a second edition, I should certainly correct it, you see. I told him what happened, you see. Well, what happened also was this. I told you we were briefed as to how we were going to put over this terrific barrage, the greatest barrage of the war, and destroy everything in front of us, and then come out and then perhaps engage in hand-to-hand -hand battle with the Germans after we had destroyed their trenches and eventually march and join up the two American armies and trap them there. Well, we were briefed, and it was Fox Connor, I told you, the chief of operations, and General Nolan gave us the story. And he said, at so-and-so, at 4.30, the, the barrage will start. At 5 o'clock, we go over the top. At 5.15, we shall have reached this point. At, at 5.35, well, among the bright boys of, our, of the uh, press corps, Freddie Ferguson of the United Press did the very clever thing. You can't say it was a false story, because what he did was to take the briefing at 4.30, we shall start the box barrage. All he did was, at 4.30, the box barrage, the, the barrage, now box barrage is small, but he meant the full length of the front barrage. At 4.30, the barrage will start. So he put down, at 4.30, we started the barrage. At 5 o'clock, all our men, the rainbow, now mentions them, you know, we are allowed to mention divisions at that day, went over the top, etc. He just put it that it happened. Now he didn't try to sneak it through or break the censorship. He went to the censor, whose was name was Captain Gerald Morgan. And he said, Captain, the censor, he says, look, here, are, here is the story in what journalists call takes, in short pieces, dated, you see, by hour, just as, Fox, as um, Dennis Nolan, General Nolan said we were going to do it. When the word, why men not be able to get back here, you see, Nobody is to write the story, besides I wouldn't have time. As headquarters announces our progress, you release these takes one by one. Naturally, headquarters announced the barrage, the jumping into no man's land, the advancing, and eventually General Pershing's triumphal entry into San Miguel, and one by one, the Gerald Morgan, the censor, released Ferguson's dispatch written in the past tense of the glorious capture of San Miguel, and to this very day, this is the story that historians accept. And they will not accept the story of the one person who was there, who says there was no capture, there was no storming, there was no glorious entry, etc., etc. Pershing himself further added insult to the truth by perhaps shading in this issue of the capture of German troops. Uh, Would you tell yes, that part that of that is an, an interesting thing that happened. You don't expect, now look, what you do not expect is that, that the American Army official communique would say, we entered San Miguel today and found that the Germans had left it at least 10 days ago, that the orders to withdraw had been issued two weeks earlier. Now you don't expect us to admit that ever, see, but that's exactly what happened. Now, Pershing eventually, in, in sending his own dispatches, you see, says this glorious victory of whatever he calls it, you see, resulted in the capture of tens of thousands of German infantry, artillerymen, 
guns, ammunition, everything else, trains, all of which was true. Why was it true? Because apparently, at least two weeks or maybe earlier, Ludendorff, I told you, the general officers are the, the whoever wins the war is because they're somewhat less stupid than the other general headquarters. Ludendorff at general headquarters, I, I'm not saying Hindenburg, but Hindenburg was a bright man, but Ludendorff in general headquarters, they had perhaps decided, they certainly had decided to reinforce San Miel, even they, be, either before they knew or maybe after they knew we were going to attack it. And so they had dispatched I don't know, at least 10,000 or more, 10, uh, no, 10,000 would only be a couple of, no, they dispatched perhaps 10 divisions of men. You see, we, we captured, I think, 10 or 20,000 men there. They had divisions of men with whole trains and munitions and artillery were dispatched to, set, to keep San Miel, and they kept coming, and a day or two after we were in town, Trains started coming in over the railroad from the north. They were coming in from the German side. They'd been on their way. They continued on their way. They landed at the railroad stations, and instead of being greeted with uh, the Wach dem Rhein or Gott mit uns, they found the American troops. They said, was ist hier los or something? And they said, put your hands up. You're prisoners of the Americans. Well, some of them very happy about it after four years of war. Of war. But nevertheless, that's how we captured these tens of thousands of prisoners. They simply walked into our land. Look, they rode in on railroad trains. And that is the whole story of San Miel. I swear to you, this, this is the fact. Not a single life was lost. Not a person was hurt. And, or if anyone fell off the plank bridge, they might have hurt his leg is about the, all I know of in the way of a um, uh, thing. Certainly bears out that old axiom. In, What'd you say? It certainly bears out that old axiom in war that the truth is the first casualty. In war, truth is the first casualty. Lord Ponsonby. That's his title of a book. George, you've uh, covered the noted and the notorious. You knew Lenin. Tell us your impressions of you, well, you met, of when you met I, Lenin. I mean, I, whether you like it or not, Lenin was the man who changed, who changed the course of this century more than any other person that I know of. I think it's it'd be admitted. I mean, Napoleon may have changed the 18th century, I mean, for good or evil, but so, the, so, so it was with Lenin. I mean, after all, uh, his interpretation of uh, Marx, which they call communism, or at first Bolshevism, certainly spread through our large part of the w w world and is still influencing the world, although uh, I mean, I think lately, I mean, with the defection of Tito, with the first great break in 1948, and then, of course, the biggest nation of all, China, uh, not accepting Marx, I mean, uh, Stalinism, there's been a great change. Nevertheless, you might say that the, that the, that the Leninist, or the, the putting into practice the 19th century philosophy of Karl Marx changed the century. Well, uh, everybody in the world was wanting to go in to, to, to interview Lenin, you know, and uh, almost no one ever did. I remember uh, uh, telegrams to the Chicago Tribune. That's the kind of telegrams you, that, that drove us into ulcers. Uh, proceed you know, interview Lenin or proceed Moscow before they start running excursion trains. You know, Clayton, who was in uh, Finland trying to get in, <laughs> he thought he'd quieten them up in Chicago. He sent them a bill for three reindeer shot from under me while trying to cross the frontier <laughs> into Russia. Well, luckily, the Hoover Relief Administration, which saved at least six million Russian lives, maybe ten, so that all the Russian leaders today really owe their lives to America. They were the children whom our food saved. And thanks to Her the Her the Herbert Hoover, the man who fed Belgium, fed the Russians, you know. There was no trace of this appeared in any Russian book. Stalin eliminated, uh, eliminated it all. You, can't, you mentioned Hoover or famine. There was no mention of even a famine. They never have famine under the Bolshevik regime, you know.
Ha, the fact is the peasants are still the enemies and they're still sabotaging and they're having frequent famines. They still have to buy grain in America. Well, anyway, um, Mr. Walter Lyman Brown was a representative of Mr. Hoover's. And in the treaty with Mr. Litvina, by which we were permitted to enter Russia to save their lives, it was specified that newspaper men have the right to go in. And this is the first time that anybody who wasn't committed to Bolshevism got into Russia, you see, and all of us flocked in there. And of course, the first thing we wanted to see was, the interview of course was Lenin. Well, Lenin had a, this was see, in 1922, you see, and I remember very well November the 7th, 1922 would have been the fifth anniversary of the Russian Revolution. And um, there was a, uh, a meeting, I don't know, the delegates of, of all the communist nations or the Comintern or something, it was in the hall of the czars in the Kremlin. And I remember, oh, the czars, throne had been pushed back in the background and there were all the leaders you know Trotsky and Zinoviev and Kamyanev and Rakovsky they were all sitting there you see and uh, uh, talk about cleverness the the uh, the soldiers at each door there was a soldier with a rifle see an illiterate soldier chosen especially because he couldn't read or write uh, you know why because by his side there was a panel and by, on the panel, there were sample cards of delegates and members and journalists, et cetera, et cetera, all of whom would be permitted to enter, you see, and nobody else. And say, this was the dais on which they were all sitting. It was above us, about three steps up. And here were the two tables with the press. And we were about, say, 20 feet from the first door coming in. And I have, or we all sort of looked up, there was a little trouble. But one of the policemen, you see, one of the guards with the rifle, he was holding up a man. The man didn't have the right card to come in, and yet he wanted to come in. Well, we looked. You'll never believe your eyes. It was <laughs> Illich Lenin, even <laughs> Illich Lenin himself. He had recovered from his first stroke. The doctor said he was capable of making a speech. Apparently, he didn't have the right card for the day, and he couldn't get in. So, of course, they got him in. And I remember this, which it's typical of something of the man's great character. As he went, Zinoviev was speaking when all this was taking place. Zinoviev was the man who spoke in a high falsetto voice, and we all hated him. <laughs> and he shrieked or something. And as he came by us to go up those three steps to mount, you see, he had to come by the press table, and he heard Zenobia speaking, and as he went by us, I looked, and he was tiptoeing, not to make a noise to disturb the speaker. Now, that's a great man in a way. There's a little episode that enlights a man's character, as Channing said, more than a whole book of biography. Eh? And, of course, then, as soon as they recognized him, what you might say in the old days was pandemonium, but it <laughs> broke loose again. It was terrific. And then he got up and he made a speech. And he spoke for an hour in Russian. Then he spoke for an hour in German. Then the same speech, I think, a third time in French. I'm not sure about the French, but I remember him pausing for a German word and turning to somebody, you see, when he was translating himself into German. Another the facet of the man's character. You see, he was being helped out. Well, as soon as he, as the, the, uh, they were, then the photographers all came in, the movie people, they were all, uh, well, there was, there was no TV, but I mean, was, there was newsreel. All, they all came in to make, to record this great event of, of his recovery from his stroke, you know. And so all his, all the big shots of the common turn and everything were hustling him into this big room where we were all to be lined up and he was to be seated in the middle and the, the common turn and the, you know, the big shots, the po Politburo, not the Polit, please, the Politburo on both sides of him, etc. cetera. Uh, well, we tried to interview him, what you might call, on the run, in this push. 
and someone started out by saying, do you speak English? Well, what a question to ask a great man. And he said, I speak him. The English language? Not so very good. <laughs> that was his answer, which was all right. And then uh, somebody did ask an intelligent question, you know, on the, around being pushed. And then someone said, uh, well, I, maybe you, I don't know, no, without asking him, he turned to, sort of looked at us and said, why do you Americans uh, make such a terrific campaign against Bolshevism? He says, after all, what is Bolshevism? Bolshevism is an interpretation of Marx. It is the interpretation of Marx in socialism originated by an American. They, and we said, who, who? And he said, why, his name was Daniel de Leon. And suddenly a great light burst on me. I thought, my father, whose first political activity was when, at the age of 25 when he was a volunteer worker for Henry George when they organized a single tax party because Henry George originated the idea of a single tax, a tax on gains, a tax on property gains, and gains you could do away with all other taxes. Could even be tried today, I think, in work, and it was never been tried in all history. Among the people who were volunteer workers, there was a Father McGlynn who organized or helped the Knights of Labor, a Catholic labor organization, and he was excommunicated for his part in this single tax thing. Louis Post, who afterwards became a member of the cabinet of some U.S. president, and uh, Daniel de Leon, who afterwards founded the, um, the Socialist Workers' Party of America, which still exists. They run a paper called The Weekly People. They're still a minor branch of socialism. They still consider themselves the purest expounders of Marxian socialism. Now, they do. Whether or not you, well, anyway, so suddenly Lenin talking to me brought, and I, I suddenly thought of my father and the man whom he knew and my father worked with named Daniel de Leon. <laughs> what did, what did and, this, and, and this was about the whole extent of the interview. George, while with the Tribune, Chicago Tribune, you uh, also went to Italy and, and covered Mussolini and the rise of fascism there. Well, you, you understand that. Uh, Mussolini, uh, up to 22, uh, was a journalist. Now, uh, uh, actually, uh, when I first met him in 1919, uh, that was before fascism was really a power, an organized power. And he was the editor of the... Uh, well, in fact, the first time I met him was at the, uh, in 1919, uh, that's right. That's when I first met him. I was sent to cover a, a strike in, uh, in Turin, the Fiat Works and so forth, and in other parts. And uh, I remember very well, uh, I had the, we all arrived there, we had heard terrible stories about the working people going on strike and yelling Viva Lenin and arming themselves and the wives of the strikers burning Mr. Fiat alive in his furnace and all like that. Well, of course, uh, as a reporter, as a, I could write this up, but what was the Hearst man to do who was sent to get pictures? So he went out and he bought all the old guns and sabers he could find in town and he hired a lot of people and he put them back of a wall and he himself wrote Viva Lenin and a sickle and hammer on it and then photographed the striking workers, you see, embracing communism in Russia, you see. Well, then of course there was the case of Signor Fiat you see who was burnt alive. So the first thing I said when I got to the hotel, I said uh, something about, and the man said, uh, my dear sir, I'm sorry, but uh, you seem to have made a mistake. Uh, Fiat is not the name of a man. Fiat stands for Fabrici Italiano Automobilique Torino, F-I-A-T. It's the automobile works of the city of the Fiat of the city of Torino. Now the owner's name Agnelli, Agnelli, 
He still is. Agnelli is one of the big, biggest men in Italy, even today. You see? He says, I can call him up for you if you want to interview him. So here's the story of the workmen's wives who were even more vicious than the working people who just yelled, Viva la Nin, the workers' wives who burnt Mr. Agnelli in his place. Well, when there was no story, uh, I was there with the, I was working with Lincoln Air, the world, with the, the world and the, and the Chicago Tribune, we figured we're not rivals exactly, so we cooperated frequently. So he said, let's go call on Mussolini. He's a fellow journalist. In fact, he was there covering parts of it. So we went over to Milan and we called on him. And uh, that's when he made a, some, a terrific declaration. He was in favor of a general strike. And he was in favor. He, he, he thought it was a little too mild or anything like that, you see. At that time, he wasn't quite, he wasn't really a fascist yet. He was just the beginning of the thing, you see. And he, he made a phrase which uh, I had it correctly written for me somewhere else later. He said, L'Italia ha bisogno di imbangua di sangue. Italy has need of a bloodbath. In other words, he thought that violence in the streets, labor, the unions, and clashing with the police would be a good thing to spill blood. He thought it would start the... Uh, the anti-government movement, of course. That was his purpose in it. And of course, later when he organized the black shirts, that's exactly what they did. They had splashes in the streets and they spilled blood wherever they could. And eventually, since he was the most powerful of all the outfits, the king gave him the uh, thing. Well, anyway, we went to see him and he made that statement that Italy needs a bloodbath. And he talked to us as, as Caro Collego, meaning my dear colleague. He called us his colleagues and all that. I mean, this was long before uh, he was, uh, you know, fascism was actually started, you know, by D'Annunzio. And also in 1919, the same year, earlier in the year, in, um, when he took Fiumi, he had the black shirts, the Dalmatian Legion, which later became the Arditi of Mussolini, he also collected all the money, you know, he, uh, they sent word to all the American Italians to support D'Annunzio's capture and make Fiumi a, an Italian instead of a Yugoslav city, send the money to my deputy in Milan, Benito Mussolini, the editor of Carrera della Sera, the editor of Il Popolo d'Italia, pardon me. And so $50,000 was raised by the Americans, which Mussolini stole. And I say stole because he was tried for theft by the Association of the Journalists of Lombardia, the biggest association of, of the press in North Italy. They tried him, and, and the, the, their verdict was that, uh, that he took the money, but he said, I used it for our, for our uh, general purpose. I organized the fascisti with her. Well, anyway, this is, uh, this is my friend Mussolini, who continued to call me Caro Collego on every occasion that I met him. In Italy, before he took office, and a uh, very interesting point, I don't know if any people know. Uh, uh, in, in October 1922 is when, is when he arrived by train, you see, the famous march on Rome. There's another great myth of history. No fascist march on Rome and occupied Rome. They came by Pullman, he came by Pullman car, and the rest came in, in, in cattle cars or ordinary passenger cars from Milan. And they got there and the king handed over the government to them, that's all. Three days later, he led a march, a triumphal march through the city himself, De Bono, Grandi, and all the big people, you see, which is called the Glorious March on Rome. Of course, I can tell you, I have a, 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 a secret in one of my books, which I call, I think it's an illustrated book called, I think it's called World Panorama. I tell the story that this glorious march on Rome is a fraud, and all the photographs were taken three days later, and I didn't supply the pictures, but Little Brown bought a bunch of pictures to illustrate my book with, and one of them is marked The Glorious March of Rome, the famous picture which I call a fraud. Only they don't identify it as that. Well, in 1924, in June, 
Mussolini had his chief competitor, the, the head of the Socialist Party, jo, Giacomo uh, uh, Mattiotti. He had him assassinated. He was stabbed 20 or 30 times and died in an automobile. Mussolini afterwards announced that he died of a uh, tuberculosis hemorrhage. The people who killed him, including Rossi, who was, or, or anyway, Filippelli and Rossi were two uh, members of the cabinet who made confessions. The actual man who stabbed him was named Dumini. I can't remember his first name, Albert or something. Dumini was from an American born in St. Louis of Italian parents, Mar uh, married, uh, either married to a Miss Williams or the son of an American woman named Williams or something. And Dumini was the actual assassin, but it doesn't matter. Rossi and Filippelli, who were members of the cabinet, took the bloodstained garments of Mattiotti and sent it to Mussolini to prove that they had done the job that he told them to do. And this man, Mussolini, actually, when Mrs. Mattiotti came, said, where is my husband? He said, I, we will find him for you. He, he may have gone away to France. Maybe he got scared or something like that. After he knew that he, that he, that they, he, I don't know what they did with the body. I don't know if the body's ever recovered. What's the story behind your expulsion from Ah, what's the story behind your expulsion from Italy? Was it well, because you exposed this? Yes. Well, look, on June 29, 1924, I was in Italy, see? Um, I built an office there, not far from the Palazzo Chigi, where the famous balcony that he addressed the crowds from. I, could, oh, I overlooked that. I could take pictures of him. He later said that I put it there purposely. says that one day I'd come with a gun and shoot him. That's what they told people at the press after. Anyway. Um, where was I? Uh, why were you expelled? Yes. So I, th this is the day in which, on February 29th, I'll never forget the date because he said, look, I forgot it was leap, leap year. I have, no, I have no appointments. I kept asking him, said, I'll talk to you for hours. I have nothing to do today. And he talked to me for a couple hours. Nothing on politics. So we discussed art and literature and poetry and music and all like that. And I noticed that the, this clever man, this who had become the head of, of a country, he figured out, well, who is it? Just a reporter, you know. So he would use phrases from Machiavelli and Nietzsche and all like that as his own, thinking, well, I'll put that over on him. He said, as far as my sex life goes, my motto has always been, thou goest to woman, do not forget thy whip. Direct out of Nietzsche, you know. I mean, it's a quote, only Nietzsche has someone say it, not, not that it was his own view, but it's from Das Beck Zarathustra and things like that. And then he, um, uh, he would use titles of, the, of books by people as, as if they were part of his vocabulary. Like, well, I am human, all too human. That's another one of Nietzsche's books, you know. Or the, uh, things like that. And, uh, well, it so happened that, <laughs> I don't know, I came across them when I was a boy in the library. And that's one of the things that, uh, that I found by being able to go to the stacks and knew all about. Well, shortly after I got this interview, it was, it was, a, it was a, uh, well, he, uh, I would say it was probably the best interview I ever had with anybody because it didn't discuss politics or daily news. It was a, a civilized interview, you might say, and it impressed me very well. His favorite sports were uh, were violating the law. I mean, by uh, were uh, by speeding speeding through the streets. You see, that was his favorite sport was was uh, auto autoing. You see, at uh, at. at you know, he killed, he killed a boy once. And Cornelius Vanderbilt, a journalist, who claims he was Mussolini's guest that day, said that Mussolini, as they killed the boy and drove on at full speed, he's, he said, uh, what is one life more in the affairs of state, Vanderbilt, and drove on. Now, that is, that is his story. I, I don't know that Mussolini was ever as crude as that. 
But anyway, all this time, the people were going around with photostats. There were no Xeroxes in those days. Of the confessions of these people as to the actual killing, who the, did the actual stabbing, what Mussolini's orders were, the part Rossi and Filippelli played in it, and all like that. Rossi made a confession, Filippelli made a confession, Dumini, I don't know what happened, he disappeared, the actual murderer. Well, like every, I had a, a good man working for me, his name was Chanfara, the father of the man who went on the Andrea Dora, remember the New York Times man uh, named, uh, I forget now, Camilo, Car I don't know if Camilo Car Chanfara was the son or the father, but anyway, the senior one, and he, he brought these documents into me and he said, look, you'll be expelled. You may even be attacked by the fascisti and given castor oil and die three months later, the most horrible death. If they pour a pint of castor oil into you, they can't, you can't say they killed me. You can live three months of the most painful and horrible pains you've ever had, and there's no solution, apparently. That's how they killed people, the fascisti. So I said, well, uh, it's my job to uh, send the news out. And Motherwell of the Chicago Daily News warned me. He says, I've had these for months, and my office knows it, and I, they don't want me. They want to keep me here. Uh, the Associated Press was run by Salvatore Cortese. The New York Times man was Arnaldo Cortese, and the London Daily Mail was a Miss Cortese. And these three people who were not card-carrying fascists, but were more fascist than anybody else except perhaps Mussolini himself, were sending the news to the biggest paper in America, the biggest paper in England, and the Associated Press, the greatest news agency in the world. And so cr crooked was these, were these Cortesis that two of their employees, one of them was a uh, became well-known writer, that Percy Winter, and I was the other one, uh, Thomas B. Morgan or something. Anyway, they would come to the office frequently after Cortese went home and Cable, the news he had suppressed, which was not favorable to Mussolini and fascism, in order to save the AP from being scooped or from being shown up as crooked. That's what they did right along. And they said, well, look, we can't, we can't use the Mussolini implication and the assassination of, uh, of Matteotti. That is simply impossible. You might get killed or you'll certainly be deported. And uh, I sent it by mail just in a letter, I sent it to either London or Paris, and they put it on the wire, it appeared, and I said, don't use it in the Paris edition, but they did, which there was no necessity for that. The Chicago Tribune sent it all over the United States, and it was used, and it finally got out. When? Months and six months after the assassination, perhaps. This was in 25, and the assassination took place in June 24. Well, um, I got ordered to leave the country, see. The press corps did one nice thing for me, with the exception of the Cortesis, who said we'd never take part in things like this. But all the rest, led by Beatrice Baskerville of the world and Hiram Motherwell of the Chicago Daily News and people like that, they called at the Foreign Office. They saw Dino Grandi, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and they came back and said, you can stay, it's okay. So I gave a dinner, and about two o'clock in the morning, we were still drinking and eating and having a wonderful time. There was a knock on the door. I had at that time an apartment in Rome. I was permanent correspondent. And there were the policemen say, pack up your things, you're leaving. And I left, and when we got to the frontier, you know, passport, we stopped on the Italian side. That, well, I, I, I knew what the fascists might do, you see, and I, certain, I heard people going through cars yelling, Dove sell this? Dove means where is in Italian. Dove sell this? Well, I thought I'd going to be in a lot of trouble here. I noticed that, you know, these little compartments, I had a whole compartment, you see, you know, uh, Pullman, they don't have them in America. Each little compartment with 
two benches on this side, after it's turned into beds, you know. Well, I happened to be alone in one, and the next there were four men. It sleeps four, you know. And two of them were in the uniform of British admirals. And then I found out they were all four were admirals. They were all from Malta. And they were all going to England via Rome and uh, Modena into France, Paris. So I walked in and I said, pardon me, Admiral, to the guy I talked with, the senior. And uh, I said, look, uh, I represent the Chicago Tribune. I'm being deported. And the fascists with their clubs, I hear them. And that they're advancing on us. And uh, they're looking for me. And you know, they'll club me to death or give me Castro or kill me one way or another. They said, we'll, we'll take care of that. Well, they, they came in. I was sitting there. But I was all, there were three in civilian clothes, you understand. And uh, they kept looking around and they said, uh, don't they sell this? The senior editor says, get out of here. We are five admirals from Malta. <laughs> and you see, this was in, in 2025. 20, I was 30, well, I was 35. I could be an admiral, 35. Lower grade. But anyway, and he threw them out. And that's what saved my life. That's one of the chances. I mean, I, is, this a, is this really a chance of losing my life? Maybe, like going over the top and finding nobody. Here was the, the fascists. I don't know. They would have done something to me, beaten me up or clubbed me anyway. You know. Well, anyway, so, no, that, so this, is the, this is my episode with Mussolini, and I uh, never saw him again or heard of him again. This is the first in our three-part series on George Seldes, a giant of a man who's been ignored in the United States by the establishment media. We have with us uh, Dr. Gene Byrd, who is a professor of journalism at the University of Texas, who not only knows, knows George Seldes, but he's also been the prime mover in getting George Seldes rehabilitated. Gene, your evaluation of George Seldes. Well, I wanted to say that what you've just seen <clears throat> is sort of living history as told by living journalists and a historian and a press critic who has that rare kind of experience of having been where history was made and with that rare courage of daring to set the record straight and correct errors by journalists and, and historians. Uh, Seldes is a man who has not been loved. He's been ignored uh, by many in the teaching and practice of uh, journalism perhaps largely because he's criticized the press so much and because teachers of journalism like myself have not been themselves in the forefront of, uh, of press criticism. And so often they accept what is in the media content as a given rather than as problematic. Mm -hmm. This man has won no Pulitzer Prizes, no honorary degrees. Uh, he's not been on the talk show uh, circuit, but thanks to ACTV and uh, Frank Morrow, <laughs> Uh, who are to be commended for this somewhat premier presentation uh, on cells uh, who has uh, been rediscovered. And I've had some part in that. Several years ago, uh, I helped establish, first of all, a special division of our National Journalism Teachers Association to recognize and encourage this kind of press criticism and to foster reporting such as cells has done as a type of research as a type of participation as well as observation if you will uh, this is a, a lot of this has been recorded in 20 some books that he's re, as he's written and with this in mind i set up a special annual award for professional excellence of this type by journalists who both practice and criticize uh, their profession uh, i immediately began a campaign in, in 1979 to make sure uh, that George Sells was given this award. I was encouraged a lot by Curtis McDougall, a professor of journalism at Northwestern University, who said to me, I worked with uh, Professor McDougall for many years, that in his opinion, uh, Sells more than anyone else living had made critical analysis of the press popular and important. So in 1980, at our uh, national convention at Boston University, uh, we arranged for ourselves to have this uh, first, this, this award. Uh, and I had the honor of presenting it to him. Uh, he had uh, taken a bus from nearby Windsor, uh, Vermont, where he lives in uh, somewhat uh, obscure uh, and lonely life. And he came down and accepted the award 
and shared with uh, many of us a lot of the kinds of things that you've just viewed him say. I was very honored, as I say, and, and yet pleasantly pleased that in, in his own words, and this is what he said, uh, quote, this is the first such honor I've ever received in my life, end of quote. That is, public recognition by the profession of journalism. Uh, at about the same time, two years ago, uh, he was being interviewed by two other journalism teachers, uh, Ev Dennis, the University of Oregon, and Claude Jean Bertrand of the University of Paris. And they wrote in Journalism and History in 1980, and I'd like to share with, with you what their perspective is in what you call uh, resurrection, uh, George might object to that word, uh, but renewed recognition. Mm -hmm. and I'd like to share this with you. This is what they, their conclusion uh, is about this man in journalism history. Uh, many of his press criticisms were picked up by the once vilified and later respected Hutchins Commission on Freedom of the Press. Oh. See, he predated that, of course. Important critics and crusaders acknowledged their debt to him, and in the end, many of his predictions have proved to be right. Uh, his once outrageous behavior made it easier for later critics who often made the same points but with more persuasive diplomacy. Press criticism is still not that popular, but it does exist. As you know, Frank, we have uh, newspaper and broadcast ombudsman, we have a few journalism reviews remaining, we have reporting on the press and the news magazines and even some press councils, as uh, in this uh, assessment Dennis and Bertrand pointed out. But all of them owe something to the legacy of George Sells, who fought a more sustained battle with greater continuity than any press critic in our history. So I'm rather proud to have had a part in the, the uh, Resurrection of George Sells, slowly he is being rediscovered. Uh, you might be interested in, in 1980, now he was 90 then, he will be 93 in uh, this uh, November. We sent out a lot of press releases uh, to scores of news media back then, uh, and uh, we were right there in the middle of Boston, New York area, and, to, and no one showed up uh, for the presentation. And to my knowledge, and word from others, and word from uh, uh, Mr. Sells, the, the press uh, still ignored him in that instance. But mm -hmm. I must say that they, he was a subject of a uh, recent feature story in the Washington Post, and uh, he has won one of the George Polk Awards uh, since ours. And his, his energy and vitality uh, indicate uh, he has a lot more years, I uh, hope, to watchdog the press. Well, let's hope so. Mm -hmm. Next week, mm -hmm. on the second section of our uh, George Sells special, he will tell you about what it was like in Germany, both before and during Hitler's regime. He met Hitler. He talked to Hindenburg. He also tells you about the pro-fascist leanings of the American press and the bribes which some of the best, uh, the top people in the American press took and then suddenly started uh, having pro-Nazi articles and pictures in their newspapers. He will also tell us about the Spanish Civil War, what it was like, and particularly how the press covered it. As he said, the press covered itself in filth during the Spanish Civil War. So we're looking forward to that next week, the second section of our three-part series on George Seldes. Good night.